Take a seat. Amen. It's great to be with you again this morning. And as Pastor Richard said, it is our last Sunday with you, which means if this sermon starts going badly, I'm just going to make a beeline out that door and you'll never see me again. So. Well, our, our passage this morning comes from Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. If you stay abreast of Christian news, you've probably noticed in recent years that there have been many stories of major pastors and other figures falling into sin, being forced to step down from ministry and even walking away from the faith entirely. Just last year, a former megachurch pastor and a popular author announced that he was leaving his wife and is no longer a Christian. Recently, another writer of dozens of well-known contemporary praise songs also announced he is renouncing his faith. And not too long ago, another popular megachurch pastor, a conference speaker, and author was fired from multiple churches after news emerged of numerous affairs. If you expand the scope to less famous figures, you begin to see many stories of pastors abandoning their faith or committing grievous sins like abuse and adultery. All these cases remind us of the power of temptation. We saw last week just how deceptive our enemy is. And we saw it how adept he is at tempting us. These stories of pastors falling remind us that the fall we talked about last week is real. Satan is real, and he is still active, seeking to deceive and devour. After hearing these kinds of stories, you might sit back and say, Wow, I can't believe they would fall in that way. Yet, if you're honest, you fall to temptation far more often than you'd like to admit. Ask yourself, when was the last time that you have fallen to the temptation to grumble in your heart? Or to uh, think of yourself instead of thinking of others? These things might seem small, but these sins are no less real. They are no less deadly. Looking at these very visible examples of major figures falling should remind us just how often we, too, fail. So, how do we face temptation, knowing how often we fall? Today, we're going to see the only person who perfectly conquered every temptation. We can learn some key ways of facing temptation, but the main point is not a nice moral lesson about how to resist temptation. No, just as last week we saw that we need a perfect one who will come and crush the head of the serpent, this week we need to have our hearts and minds refocused on Jesus Christ, who is that one who would come to crush the head of the serpent as prophesied in Genesis 3, verse 15. Where Adam failed in the garden, Jesus prevails. And through this account of this temptation in the wilderness, we'll be reminded of the importance of seeing and savoring our perfect Savior, who is the second Adam who did what we never could. Let's turn now to this passage, Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. And read of this Savior. As we read, please stand if you're able to honor God's word. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. This is God's word. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone." 
Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, you shall, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this word where we can see the perfect Adam, the perfect second Adam, resisting temptation like we never could. Lord, we ask that you would open our ears and our hearts and minds to humbly hear from you this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you would help me to accurately and faithfully preach your word, that it would not be the ideas of man, but the very word of God that is proclaimed this morning. We pray that you would be with us and bless us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. Remember what occurred right before our passage this morning in Matthew's Gospel. The birth of Jesus is recounted, followed by John the Baptist preparing the way for the Messiah. Immediately before our section this morning is the baptism of Jesus. Now, the baptism of Jesus was not just an interesting historical detail that Matthew threw in for fun. The baptism of Jesus teaches us Jesus' true identity. When John baptizes Jesus in the Jordan, the heavens are opened, the Spirit of God descends on Jesus like a dove, and we can hear the voice of the Father speak from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The identity of Jesus as the Son of God is publicly and dramatically proclaimed for all to see. And this leads us to what may be a, an unexpected next turn in the gospel, which is the temptation in the wilderness. So jumping right into this passage, first we're going to see in verses 1 to 4 that Jesus proves to be the perfect second Adam in the face of temptation when our Savior perfectly trusts in God's provision. Our Savior perfectly trusts in God's provision. In verse 1, we're first introduced to the origin of the temptation. This might be surprising if you haven't read this passage carefully before, but it's actually the spirit that drives Jesus into the wilderness. This is the same spirit that just a few passages, a few verses before, descended upon Jesus like a dove who is now driving him into the wilderness to be tested. Why would Matthew include this detail? Why would he tell us that it's the Spirit who drives him into the wilderness? It's because God is telling us that he is at work in this time of testing. Later in Scripture, we see in James that God does not tempt anyone to sin. He's perfectly holy and cannot be tempted, nor can he tempt anyone. However, God is at work during times of temptation and testing, just as he is here. And in verse 2, we're secondly introduced to the representative nature of this temptation. You see, Matthew, in recording this temptation, was painting a carefully crafted picture of Jesus as the perfect second Adam, who would conquer where Adam was defeated. He is that offspring of the woman we talked about last week who would crush the head of the serpent. Not only that, Matthew presents hints and parallels showing that Jesus is also the perfect Israel and the greater Moses. Remember, Israel was tested for 40 years in the wilderness. God rescued them up out of slavery in Egypt to be his people. And as they were tested for 40 years in the wilderness, they constantly failed. They constantly fell into idolatry, they grumbled, and they doubted God. Jesus, on the other hand, is the perfect Israel. Jesus was tested for 40 days in the wilderness and, unlike Israel, perfectly conquered all temptation. Likewise, Moses, who was the Old Covenant lawgiver, fasted for 40 days before receiving the law 
in delivering it to the people. Yet the Old Testament clearly presents Moses as an imperfect messenger. So imperfect, in fact, that he was not even able to enter the promised land with the people. Matthew is painting Jesus as the greater Moses, who also fasted for 40 days before beginning his public teaching ministry. Yet, unlike Moses, Jesus fulfills the law perfectly in himself and leads his people up out of slavery to sin. Through all of this, I want you to see and treasure Jesus as the perfect representative of humanity. Where we failed in the garden, he conquers. Where we succumb to temptation in the wilderness, he is victorious. Through this text, we're not just being taught a lesson about how to address different kinds of temptation, although we can draw that out. No, Jesus is showing us how he perfectly defeated temptation like we never could, so that we would trust in him alone. Turning now to the first temptation, look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, And the tempter came, to, came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Here, Satan, who's identified as the tempter, is tempting Jesus to use his power outside of God's will, to doubt God's provision. We'll see in all of these temptations, there is both a bit of a truth and a lie. Just as last week we talked about Satan's strategy is first to twist, then deny, this week we'll see that there's a bit of truth and a lie in each of these temptations. The truth is that Jesus, who is the very Son of God, does indeed have the power to create food for himself. This is clearly demonstrated in the feeding of the 5,000 and then later the feeding of the 4,000 in his ministry. Yet there's a lie at work here as well. That lie is that Jesus needed to provide for himself outside of God's will. Jesus' life on earth was lived in perfect obedience to the will of the Father. This is a dynamic that Satan was trying to overturn through this temptation. Jesus perfectly trusted in God's provision, knowing that even the food that sustained his life came from God's hand and would come in God's time. He did not have to take matters into his own hands. Well, what is Jesus' response to this temptation? Look at verse 4. Jesus answers by saying that obedience is more important even than food. Jesus' weapon wielded against the enemy is one that's at our own disposal as well, which is the word of God. We must all take up arms in our fight against Satan, and Jesus shows us exactly how to do that by hiding God's word in our hearts. Think about it. Jesus did not pull out a scroll there in the wilderness and start searching for a suitable verse. And he certainly couldn't pull out an iPhone and start searching verses about temptation. But he had so filled his heart and mind with God's word that it spilled out in response to this temptation. Jesus here quotes Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, and he says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What's he saying? He's saying obedience to God takes precedence even over self, even over our need for food. In John's gospel, Jesus even called obedience his food. Obeying God's will and trusting in God's provision is the most important thing in our lives, even when it means difficulty and pain, as it does here for Jesus. There are deeper needs even than food, which seems like it's the most basic of human needs. These needs can only be met by God and his word. So, the question for you this morning is, are you living your life in light of this spiritual reality? Or are you like many who think that you can live by bread alone without regard to God and his word? What's more important to you, submission to God or success at work? A life that results in the commendation of men or a life that results in hearing, well done, good and faithful servant? You see, many people think that they would just be happier if they had more. 
Maybe you're this way. Maybe you think, if I just had that house or that car, then I'd finally be fulfilled. But wealth cannot meet your deepest longings and needs. No, nothing on this earth can. Michael Norton, who's a professor at Harvard Business School, surveyed high net worth individuals about their happiness in 2018. These are people who are very rich. And what did he find? Almost everyone said that they would need two or three times as much wealth to be perfectly happy. No matter how much they had, it was never enough to fulfill them. And I saw this growing up in Los Angeles. The wealthiest friends I had were typically in the most deeply unhappy homes. Many grew up to be broken men and women in many ways. Why? Because far too many people live as if they can live by bread alone. And if only they had some more bread, then they would be truly fulfilled. Yet earthly food cannot satiate a spiritual hunger. Jesus' response to this temptation proves that every human being has a hunger that can only be fulfilled by obedience to God. Furthermore, we must resist the temptation to look for fulfillment in anything other than God and his word. So far, we've seen in this first temptation that our Savior perfectly trusts in God's provision. Now that perfect trust is going to be put to the test in the second temptation. In the second temptation of verses 5 to 7, we'll see that Jesus proves to be the perfect second Adam in the face of temptation when our Savior perfectly trusts in God's protection. Our Savior perfectly trusts in God's protection. Now the devil takes Jesus to a new place, to the holy city, Jerusalem. He places him on the pinnacle, the highest point of the temple, and tempts him again. In verse 6, the devil says to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Do you notice how Satan is using Scripture? This is just a small reminder to us that our enemy truly is a master of deception. It reminds us that just because someone is uh, using scripture does not mean they're automatically godly and truthful. People can and do twist the scriptures to their own ends, misleading people and taking advantage of those who are not discerning. We must always test how scripture is being used, never blindly accepting it without a discerning ear. The substance of this second temptation is that the devil, the devil wants Jesus to force God's hand to protect him. Again, we see both a truth and a lie at work here. The truth is that Psalm 91 verse 11, which Satan quotes here, promises that God will protect his people. And if God will protect his people in general, how much more are the very son of God? Yet, there's a lie at work as well. The lie is that Jesus has to prove God's protection. Satan is essentially saying, if you really trust in God, which Jesus said he did in the first temptation, then prove it. Yet, if Jesus were to listen to Satan, he would be turning the dynamic of his life here on earth on its head. The eternal Son of God took on flesh and lived a life of perfect obedience to the Father. He did this in order to give his life as a ransom to redeem his people, not to force the Father's hand to protect him in a dramatic fashion. Does Jesus give in? No, he says in verse 7 that one should not test God. Jesus again wields the weapon of Scripture against the enemy, revealing the deceptive nature of the enemy's use of this psalm. In verse 7, Jesus says, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus again here quotes Deuteronomy. In this case, it's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. And this verse originally is referring to Israel testing the Lord at Massa. This is an incident in the wilderness where the people grumbled against Moses, demanding that he immediately provide water for them. In that incident in the wilderness, they were testing the Lord, doubting that he was truly among them. 
They should have trusted that God would provide water, just as he had provided food and everything else that they needed. Instead, they demanded that God miraculously provide water on demand, not waiting on his timing. Thus, they were testing God, not trusting in him. Jesus, however, again shows himself to be the perfect Israel. Where Israel had doubted and tested God, Jesus trusts in God's protection without testing. He knows that he will be protected until his mission is finished, and he doesn't need to prove that to anyone, especially not Satan. For us, the reality is that we are invincible until God is done with us. But this is something that we grasp by faith, not by testing God. Jesus, the very incarnate Son of God, was the perfect example of this kind of trust in submission while on earth. God is not our heavenly butler to be commanded about. We who have trusted in Christ are privileged to be his servants. He does not exist to serve us and perform parlor tricks. So if you put your hand over a candle to test God, you're going to walk away with a burn. But if you step out in faith to share the gospel, you will not have a scratch on you until you have fulfilled your heavenly mission. John Patton, who maybe some of you have heard of before, was a famous missionary to cannibal tribes in the New Hebrides. And he said this truth perfectly. He said this, I realized that I was immortal till my master's work with me was done. I saw this firsthand on the mission field. As many of you know, we served in a country that was not friendly towards the gospel and has a surveillance grid unlike that seen anywhere else in the world. Yet, we were able to meet with pastors, train leaders, hold Bible studies, share the gospel, and train others to do the same. Local brothers and sisters would openly send sensitive Christian materials and use keywords that would cause conversations to be flagged. They would mention missions and underground churches, etc., yet nothing happened. I am confident that God was protecting us, that he had a reason for us to be there for those years. But I would have been guilty of the same sin as the Israelites, the same sin that Jesus conquered in this temptation if I tried to deliberately test God's protection by doing something stupid or dangerous. I had to silently, to patiently trust that God would protect me as long as he wanted me to be there. We're all called to boldly step out in faith and to not live in fear. But in the same way, we're called to use wisdom and not to test God's protection. However, all of this does not mean that God will always protect his servants. In fact, it means that sometimes God's plan includes suffering. And this is a truth that we see clearly in the third temptation. We've seen in the first two temptations that our Savior perfectly trusts in God's provision and perfectly trusts in God's protection. In the third temptation here in verses 8 through 11, we see that Jesus proves to be the perfect second Adam in the face of temptation when our Savior perfectly trusts in God's plan. Our Savior perfectly trusts in God's plan. We see another change of location as Jesus begins his third temptation. Now Jesus is brought to a high mountain to face this final temptation. The devil showed Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world in their glory, perhaps in a vision. The enemy then says that he will give Jesus all those kingdoms in all their glory if he just falls down and worships him. What's the substance of this temptation? It's the temptation to get the crown without the cross. Again, we see some truth mixed with lies here in this passage. First, the truth is that Jesus was destined to have all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. This was spoken of throughout the Old Testament, that the Messiah would rule all the nations. Let's look at just a few of these many instances that show this global inheritance promised to the Messiah. You don't have to turn to all these references. You can just listen. I want you to get a feeling for how present this theme is throughout the Old Testament. The Psalms, for instance, 
constantly look forward to all nations, not just Israel, praising their creator. The vision was always for a global kingdom. This can clearly be seen in Psalm 2, verses 7 to 8, which says this, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten of you, begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. The New Testament picks up on this verse as talking about Jesus, showing that he was always destined to have all the nations as his inheritance. Later in the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel uh, shows this theme quite clearly as well. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 records a vision where Daniel sees what he calls one like a son of man who comes before the ancient of days, that is, God the Father. In verse 14, Daniel says, And to him, that is this son of man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. In his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. In the New Testament, Jesus identifies himself as this son of man, the one whose global kingdom will never pass away, unlike all those who have come before. This theme becomes all the more clear in the New Testament with the Great Commission of Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Here Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is why we pray for, give to, and personally engage in missions. Because we know that we are to make disciples among every people group on the face of the earth because Jesus died for people from every tribe, tongue, and nation and will use us to bring them into the kingdom. We thus see that Jesus was indeed destined to have all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. But the enemy <clears throat> was tempting him to obtain it outside of God's will. The lie behind this temptation is that Jesus could have splendor without suffering. He could have the crown without the cross. He could have all the glory without the grueling path to get there. Can you understand this appeal? You may have felt the same tug when tempted to cheat in school or to cut corners at work. You can get all the acclaim without any of the anguish. But that's not how God works. Look at the way God worked in China in 1900 with an infamous incident we call the Boxer Rebellion. Maybe some of you have heard of this before. According to one count, at least 167 Protestant missionaries and their children were martyred in that incident. In addition, at least 2,000 Chinese Protestant Believers and 30,000 Chinese Roman Catholics were reported to have been murdered in that nationalistic uprising. What was the result? Maybe the death of the church in China? No, far from it. <clears throat> what followed was a huge breakthrough in the spread of the gospel in that country, as people saw believers' willingness to face death for their faith in Christ. A new wave of missionaries went to China from the West, and countless people trusted in Christ. God's way to the crown is through the cross. What's Jesus' response to this temptation? Look with me at verse 10. For the first time, Jesus directly rebukes Satan before again quoting Scripture. In saying, be gone, Satan, Jesus is actually issuing a command. This isn't a request, but this is the superior telling the inferior that he'll no longer put up with him. In this temptation, Satan was trying to get Jesus to obey him, 
But ironically here, we see Satan obeying the command of Jesus. Then Jesus recalls the command of Deuteronomy 6, verse 13, to worship and serve the God alone. <clears throat> no matter how bad his suffering would be, Jesus would never compromise. Jesus would never take the easy and unfaithful path to exaltation, even knowing that it would cost him the most humiliating, painful death possible. After Satan leaves in response to Jesus' command, we see the angels come and minister to him. Interestingly, the word used in Greek here for minister actually means to serve, and it comes from the word used of waiters serving food. So many scholars argue that Matthew's choice to use this word indicates that the angels' service to Jesus also included them miraculously giving him food. Can you see how this is turning the temptations on their head? Satan tempted Jesus to provide bread for himself and to force God's angels to protect him. But after the temptations are over, those very angels come to serve him and provide him food. This proves the angels truly are at Jesus' disposal, but he never uses his power outside of the Father's will. This end to the temptations also proves that Jesus could have commanded Satan to flee from the very beginning. But Jesus allowed himself to be fully tempted so that he could truly be the second Adam. And so that he would be, as we read earlier, the perfect high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses like us in every way except without sin. Throughout this third temptation, we see Jesus perfectly trusting in God's plan, even though he knows what is in store for him. Just how painful and bloody that path would be. And what is that plan? It is the cross. The rescue plan was put into motion in eternity past, and it required a sacrifice for sin. Jesus knew that he came to, as Matthew 20, 28 famously says, give his life as a ransom for many. This would be accomplished through Jesus' perfect work on the cross. Through these temptations, we've seen that Jesus lived a perfect life, constantly conquering sin and perfectly obeying the will of the Father. Why would he then die the kind of death only the worst criminals deserve to die. It's because he was taking the punishment for the sin of everyone who would ever believe in him. This is what we call the great exchange. If you put your faith in Jesus, he pays the penalty for your sin in your place. In his perfect righteousness, his perfect obedience to the Father, his conquering of every temptation is counted as if it were yours. Yet the good news does not end merely with Jesus' death and burial on our behalf. Just as he triumphed over these three different temptations, he rose from the grave three days later victorious over death. He was exalted to the right hand of the Father to claim that crown for which he died, an inheritance of all nations, the very thing that Satan had tempted him with. In the beginning, we talked about some very visible instances of pastors giving in to temptation and falling. Do you recognize that you're guilty of the very same thing, though not as visible, on a daily basis? Can you see how your own heart is corrupted, how it's bent towards sin? Can you see your need for this perfect Savior to come and die in your place, the one who alone has triumphed over all temptation. The burning question for you this morning is, have you trusted in this perfect Savior? Don't walk away thinking that you can just work harder, you can resist temptation, and earn God's favor. No, every day you fall in many ways, as we all do. Have you recognized that constant failure to stand up to temptation and your need for one to come and rescue you from God's wrath. Trust in that one. Trust in the perfect Lord Jesus 
today. If you're already trusting in him, I hope that this is a sobering reminder of just how much you need him. Turn back to him today and thank him for living that perfect life that you have failed to live, always triumphing over temptation, dying in your place, and rising from the dead. As Pastor Richard said earlier, if you have not come to personally know this Savior, please talk to your pastors because there really is no more important decision that you can make. Join me now in praying to this glorious Savior as we sing to him again. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for sending your Son, sending your Son to live that perfect life that we have failed to live, to triumph over temptation, knowing that we so often fall to give us that perfect example, not just so that we can work harder, but so that we can trust in him and his sacrifice in our place, dying for the sins that we have committed and rising from the grave triumphant over sin and death. We ask, Lord, for those who have not yet trusted in him, that you would move in their hearts this morning. And for those of us that are trusting in him, Lord, please give us a renewed joy, a renewed love for our Savior. And help us, Lord, to make disciples, to proclaim this gospel of the one who came and lived and died for people from every tribe and tongue and nation, so that he may get that inheritance for which he died. We pray this in his glorious name. Amen. And let's now stand together and sing.